Hello and welcome to the second Inspiring Ecology podcast. It has taken me a while to make this podcast. I have a podcast on apex predators, all good to go, but time has gotten away from me. A few events this week suggested I should record this podcast instead. So apologies in advance, this is not related to ecology. However, I do hope you find it useful all the same. Just to reiterate who I am, as most people won't know me, my name is Dr. Martin Hughes. I am an evolutionary ecologist from Scotland, currently living in New South Wales, Australia. I teach science and I love talking about it, but that's not what I'm going to speak about today. Another passion I have is studying the mind, studying how we think. I believe I've always been a deep thinker, and I guess that's why studying science has been so rewarding. However, thinking too much can have its downsides. I have found myself, more than once, in a dark place that I sometimes couldn't escape from. Over the past seven years or so, I have practiced techniques and read read lots of literature on the topic, mainly to try and improve my own state of mind, to pull myself out of the dark corners and into the light. A lot of what I'll talk about today is easier said than done, but I hope some of the techniques I will discuss will help you, if you need it. And even if you don't need any help or advice, I hope this is interesting all the same. We all get scared. This emotion is often manifested as worry or anxiety in everyday life. We experience these feelings on a day-to-day basis when we encounter unfamiliar situations or we have to speak in front of a large crowd or deal with an unavoidable confrontation. Most of our fear actually manifests itself before or after the act itself has taken place. This is because humans have an amazing ability to predict outcomes of situations before they even arise. We can do this by simulating scenarios in our own heads and assessing the possible outcomes. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, this is a powerful tool that allows us as animals to consider all possible perspectives and make a judgment call on the best course of action. For example, if we were trying to climb to the top of a tree, we could visualize ourselves climbing the tree, ensuring we place each hand and foot carefully onto the branches to limit the chance that we slip, fall and plummet to our deaths. Now, being able to play these scenarios through has the obvious benefit of allowing our imagined self to die rather than the real thing. And this has obvious benefits, like I say, um, particularly when we're talking about life expectancy. Where this tool becomes problematic is when we are in, no longer in control of it. And these scenarios play on loop in our own minds even months or years after the event. Physiologically, our bodies do not know that the scenario playing in our heads is not the real deal. Chemicals and hormones are released into our body and our bloodstream can be flooded with adrenaline and cortisol. This biological response is extremely beneficial in a real life or death situation, um, but is not so good if you're sat in an armchair stressing over that big presentation you have to deliver or that really stupid thing you did six months ago. Scientists have actually proved long-term exposure to things like cortisol, also known as the stress hormone, can have implications on health and memory. Therefore, our fantastic ability to simulate simulations in our minds can become a psychological prison which affects both mental and physical health. Remember, you are always in control of your mind. Now, you may not always feel like that's the case, Your mind may be racing a million miles a minute, replaying that situation over and over again in your head. No matter what you do, you just can't get it out of your head. The good news is, yes, you can regain control, although it will take some time and some willpower to do so. I already mentioned your mind is a tool. A tool is something you can use when you need it in certain situations. However, you do not need to use it all of the time. Our minds are no different from our hands. We use our hands to open doors, tie our shoelaces, pick up cutlery to eat, 
but we don't spend our lives being pulled around by our hands or going wherever our hands want to go. We control them. Yes, they are extremely useful, but they don't have a life of their own. Our minds are no different. They're just another part of us that we can use when needed. The only difference is we cannot see our mind. It is internal and invisible. And the danger arises when people cannot distinguish between themselves and their minds. They believe they are their minds. This is simply not true. In this case, you have become a slave to your own mind. All is not lost though. There are some useful strategies you can begin to implement to make your mind work for you, not the other way around. So number one, be the watcher. Perhaps one of the most powerful books I've read is called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. I strongly recommend you read it after listening to this podcast, of course. In his book, Eckhart Tolle tells us to practice being the watcher. The watcher of our thoughts. Most people live their lives reacting to thoughts and feelings that they did not ask for. For example, when someone cuts in front of you while driving, or a car speeds past you when you're trying to cross the street. Most people, myself included, instantly feel angry and even enraged. The term road rage is so popular because most drivers have experienced it. You often find yourself mumbling how stupid that person is for at least a minute or so after the fact. And you can feel the anger bubble up within you and it can take over sometimes. This response can be heightened when you're running late for something, making us even more irate under pressure. Now, these thoughts and feelings are not unique to driving, but next time something like that happens to you, take a moment to watch where that thought comes from. Did you ask your mind to have that thought? Or did it just pop into your head and result in an emotional response? Is an extremely powerful insight into the inner workings of your own mind. Practice watching your mind over the next few weeks and you may find many of the thoughts that you have are not necessarily your own, but your mind's. By simply watching these thoughts, you provide some mental distance between the thought process and the associated emotional response, allowing you to regain control over how you respond to those thoughts, if at all. Number two. Emotional memories. Sometimes we fall into a pattern of playing the same scenario over and over again in our heads. This can be a hard cycle to break. However, it can be achieved by using some techniques. When you start playing the situation in your head, we can reduce the emotional attachment of it by replaying it in black and white. If you cannot get that image out of your head, at least we can change how we view it internally. By removing the colour, we remove a lot of the emotion attached to that event. Practice removing the colour from the memory and it should help reduce our emotional response attached to it. Another technique you can use in conjunction to this is limiting the size of the image. Not unlike cropping a picture on your laptop or your phone or reducing the size of a video player to fit into that PowerPoint presentation, we can reduce the size of the memory player in our head. By reducing the size, we also reduce the importance and sometimes the resolution of that memory. Number three, setting goals. Articulating goals can transform your life. I believe spending time thinking about your goals and writing them down is the most important thing you can do. If you have no goals and nothing to aim for, you're effectively floating through life and allowing life to happen to you. If you're not actively seeking something, you're missing so many opportunities it's not even funny. Put it this way, if I know what it is I want out of life, if I see an opportunity that is going to help me achieve that goal, I will grab it with both hands. If I do not know what it is I want out of life, Opportunities are going to pass me by left, right and centre and I won't even recognise them as opportunities. 
These things will pass me by and I will just sleepwalk through life, having absolutely no direction. A powerful quote I read somewhere that has always stuck with me is this. Most people die in their early 20s, but they aren't buried until they're 70. What is meant by this is people give up on their dreams or goals and settle. They settle for a life they don't want because it's easier to do. They settle for a half-decent job, a half-decent husband or wife, because it's not so bad. They live their entire lives waiting for retirement, having achieved nothing that they wanted to achieve and die having fulfilled none of their ambitions. As soon as you allow your dreams or goals to die, you die, spiritually speaking. Now, as a scientist, I'm careful to talk about phenomena that I can't fully explain, including spirituality, fate and destiny. However, just because I can't fully explain something does not mean it doesn't exist. I believe everyone has a passion, something that they absolutely love to do. And how do we recognise that? Well, clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson, in his book 12 Rules to Life, describes these as pursuits or activities in which we lose track of time and forget about everything. He suggests we need to pay extremely close attention to these activities. For example, if you're playing a game of football and time absolutely flies by and before you know it, an hour has passed, this is your subconsciousness telling you something that you need to pay attention to. In my own personal experience, this has always been the outdoors and animals. If I find myself climbing a Monroe, which is another name for a hill in Scotland, or now walking in the bush here in Australia, I lose myself. I lose my inner monologue. I lose my thoughts. And importantly, I lose any concept of time. The same thing happens when I'm reading, teaching or talking about animals. Peterson is adamant that this is our subconscious telling us what we need to be paying attention to. So why do these things have such an effect on me? I generally have no idea. All I know is I've loved nature and animals since I was a young child, and something inside of me loves this area of study. Is this fate? I have no idea. Is it my destiny to follow these passions? Who knows? All I know is I've paid attention to these passions and I've dedicated my life to them. And am I happy about that? Yes. I couldn't really imagine my life without these things in them. And if I do imagine it, if I try hard, it doesn't really fill me with joy to think that these things would be absent from my life. Another powerful quote from Peterson's book comes from Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Carl Jung. He says, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. I have no idea why I like the things I do. If these ideas existed before you did, or gave birth to you instead of the other way around, then don't you think you should be chasing them down? Pay attention to the things you love, and maybe you should spend your life doing those things instead of a job you hate until you retire. Number four, is that all you have? Everyone in life has had a negative experience and if they haven't, they soon will. Unfortunately, a fact of life is everything is in a constant state of change. Nobody asks to be born and everybody dies. Now that may seem a little pessimistic, but it's actually liberating when you fully comprehend what it means. Everyone has a beginning, their birth, and an end, their death. Now we don't know when the latter occurs, it could be 40 years from now hopefully, or a bit longer, or it could be tomorrow. What we do know is we are in control of what happens between these two events. We can spend our lives worrying about trivial things like what other people think of us, not taking risks because we want to live comfortably, and just accepting what is given to us instead of striving for more. The fact is, you're in control of how you spend your time and what you want to get out of life. And unfortunately, bad things happen to everyone. Importantly, 
It's what you do when these bad things happen that can shape the rest of your life. You can let these bad things define who you are. You can carry them around like heavy rocks in your pockets and allow them to be your excuse why you haven't achieved what it is you have not achieved. Alternatively, you can use these negative experiences to motivate yourself and achieve more. You can use them to motivate yourself and chase down everything you want in life because you understand how short life is and how unfair it can be. I firmly believe people are challenged at least once in their lives, like seriously challenged by an event that brings everything in your life to a grinding halt. During these moments, you question absolutely everything in your life and can often find yourself asking, what is the point? I feel this is rock bottom. This is a cold, hard place that forces you to dig deep and figure out who you really are. If you have reached rock bottom, or you're currently living there, I cannot understate how much strength you have. If you're still here, after life has dealt you blow after blow, you have true grit. You have a resilience and a willpower that you can use to achieve greatness. I also believe that earlier in your life you face these challenges, the better prepared you'll be for future ones. Some people sleepwalk through their lives and do not face any real challenge until they're adults. And most of these people are not equipped to deal with the challenge because they've never had to and their world grinds to a halt and sometimes it never recovers. A midlife crisis is a transition of identity and self-confidence that can occur in middle-aged individuals, typically 45 to 64 years of age. If you are seriously challenged in your younger years, you figure out who you are and what you can deal with early on. When you find yourself in a situation that others have no idea how to cope with, you stride through that crisis because you've already dealt with much worse. When people are asking themselves, why me? You're responding, is that all you've got? Use your experience as motivation. Moving on after reaching rock bottom is not easy, but there is no stronger foundation to build your life upon as you'll be able to face all future challenges head on, knowing nothing can be worse than what you've already experienced. Number five, channeling emotion. If we imagine emotions like water, the water has to go somewhere. Let's imagine the water has to go through a series of large pipes within us. We can direct the water through the pipes and use them in a positive way. We can re redirect the flow of the water into somewhere useful. Being angry is a strong emotion. If you're angry at someone or something, and cannot release that anger via evaporation, channel it and use it for something useful. If I get angry or stressed, I pick up my running shoes and I run until my legs hurt. I use the anger to push myself further than I would normally. When I start to feel tired, I get a stitch or my legs begin to hurt. I get angry with myself. I ask myself, am I really going to give up? Am I that much of a loser that I cannot run up this hill? Now, this probably doesn't sound great, particularly when we are talking about negative self-talk, um, which is what we're trying to avoid. However, if I use this to help motivate me to achieve something positive, like increasing my cardiovascular fitness or to lift that heavier weight, then the long-term benefit outweighs, outweighs the short-term pain. It's all about controlling your mind and emotions, not getting rid of them completely. They can be powerful weapons to help you achieve things in life. You just have to be skilled enough to use them when needed and lock them away safely when they are not. Number six, exercise. This moves us nicely into the realm of exercise. Why not vent your anger on a video game or to your partner or spouse? Well, number one, neither of these are good for our long-term health. And number two, these are not really appropriate outlets for our emotion. Channeling our emotions into exercise has the dual benefit of not only making you healthier, but happier. 
as hormones are released when we push our bodies to the limit. I cannot understate how important exercise is in helping mental health. If you seriously push yourself to the limit during a run without injuring yourself, your brain will flood your body with endorphins, a group of hormones which produce an analgesic effect. An analgesic effect is similar to that of a painkiller. Your body produces these hormones during exercise to limit the perception of pain. And this may not come as a surprise for anyone that's pushed at the gym or tried to run up that hill. The painkiller effect of endorphins is similar to that of morphine and codeine, and it targets the brain's reward system, which also induces feelings of pleasure and euphoria. By channeling a potentially negative emotion into exercise, you may achieve a completely different emotional state afterwards. The endorphin release will override your brain's emotional circulatory system as your body goes into pain relief mode, resulting in feelings of happiness and elation. In short, if you're feeling down, stressed, angry, sad, or you just need a boost, grab your running shoes and run until you can't run anymore. Number seven, we are tribal animals. Humans are intelligent apes. We evolved from a common ancestor of chimpanzees approximately seven million years ago. We have similar features and also by examining primate behavior, we've shed new light on the behavior of our early hominid ancestors. We, like chimps, are tribal animals. Primates work best surrounded by others. It increases individual safety, our ability to find valuable resources, and it's important for our emotional well-being, as we are social animals that crave interaction with others. And this last part is hardwired into our brains. And this is fine when we're surrounded by good people. However, it can cast us into a deep, dark corner of our mind if we're rejected, ridiculed, or shunned by our peers. This is particularly true in our formative teenage years as we struggle for a spot in the hierarchy. For a teenager, the world is open-ended and the possibilities are endless. You don't know what job you're going to have when you're older. You don't know where you're going to live. And importantly, you don't know who your long-term mate will be. Your mind is constantly reminding you of these facts, even subconsciously, which magnifies the importance of these relationships. Now. Compare this to an older person, for example, who is maybe counting how many years they have left on the planet, not how, not how many they've lived for. They've found their mate, they've acquired a job and found a place to live and settle down. It's clear to see that maintaining such large social networks for older people is much less valuable than younger people. As younger people put so much value on these social interactions, it can lead to extreme emotional turmoil when things don't always go according to plan. And the strong behavioural need to belong may cloud judgement when it comes to making the right friends and decisions when you just want to fit in. There are a few points I want to make about this. Friends are important, and yes, we are tribal animals. But sometimes walking away from toxic friendships that no longer serve us is the best thing to do. Walking away and being a lone wolf for a while may seem like the worst thing in the world at the time. However, being able to walk alone when you need to build strength and resilience also allows you to rely on yourself in the future. What is important for you to realise is you're in control of who is in your tribe. The people you choose to surround yourself with are a reflection of who you are as a person. If you surround yourself with losers, guess what, you'll be a loser too. If you surround yourself with winners, you'll most likely be a winner too. What do I mean by losers and winners? Well, in my estimation, losers are people who do do not want the best for you. They may ridicule you in front of others, they may set the bar low for themselves, and they have no values or morals. And they're people who look out for themselves and are happy to trip you up and make you feel bad for chasing your dreams. A winner then is someone who wants the best for you always. Someone who lifts you up and never tries to tear you down. Someone who encourages you to achieve your goals 
and is genuinely happy for you when you do something amazing. Now, you might be thinking, I don't know many people like that. And this is about quality, not quantity. If you start to slim down your tribe to people that possess these qualities, you may be left with a handful of people or no one at all at this moment in time. And this is a good thing. Losers are dead weight that hold you back from achieving your goals. Shedding the dead weight is a good thing. Winners are the opposite. They hold ropes wrapped around your waist and help help pull you up towards your goals. And the feeling is mutual as you hold a rope for them. Remember, if your circle of friends gets smaller from this process, your circle will be stronger for it. A major roadblock that holds people back from initiating this process is anxiety about what people think of them. People spend most of their time worrying about what other people think of them, even people who are not good for them, because we're so paranoid about losing our social standing and our social network. Well, here is a good exercise if you're worried about what people think of you. Think about how many seconds of the day you genuinely spend thinking about other people and what they are doing. Do you spend even a minute per day thinking about anyone other than yourself? Most people don't. Most people don't even spend five seconds a day thinking about anyone other than themselves. So what makes you so special? What makes you think that anyone is spending any of their time thinking about you? Again, this is not a bad thing. This is liberating. When you realize how little people are thinking about you, and how little they care about what you're doing day to day, you can stop worrying about it because they're not thinking of you. So how do you grow a strong tribe? First and foremost, be the friend you would like to have. Be reliable, loyal, and trustworthy. Be funny, supportive, and caring. Be the friend you want to have, and you will attract the right sort of people into your life. The law of attraction is a powerful thing. Think about it. Who would you rather be friends with? The nasty person who attacks people all the time, either verbally or even physically, or the genuinely nice person who has people's best interests at heart? Be that person and you will attract the right sort of people into your life. Surround yourself with people who want the best for you and you will achieve more. Go out and meet people. Find a role model. Find someone who currently has a future job you want and ask them all about it. Number eight. Read more and listen to podcasts, obviously. This podcast. We like to believe that we know it all. And people who believe they know it all, in fact, know nothing at all. If you're ignorant of your own ignorance, you're limiting your ability to learn and grow. The world we live in is full of information, which has its pros and cons. The plus side is we can find almost anything we want by typing it into a search engine. The downside of this is there's so much information, it can be hard to find the truly life-changing advice. When reading a book or listening to a podcast, I always imagine it is the same process as Neo from The Matrix goes through when he's been plugged in and learns all the different martial arts. The more books you read, or interesting people you listen to, the more things are uploaded into your brain, which may be useful later on in life. The more time you spend playing video games or vegetating over a Netflix marathon, the less time you're spending enriching your mind with incredible information. Now, I'm not saying you don't have to spend time doing the things you enjoy, Um, You'd have to be some sort of robot if you didn't get hooked by making a murderer or watching Vikings on Netflix. I get it, I do it. All I'm saying is that every hour you spend on games or watching TV, try and spend the same amount of time reading or listening to an interesting podcast. If you consider your spare time like money, you should strive to build up a surplus amount of money in your bank account, doing things that are good for you like reading and listening to podcasts. Once you've built up some money, by all means, spend a little on doing the things you enjoy. But like any bank account, you don't want to get yourself into debt. And you can accumulate a heavy debt of time by spending too much of it in front of a screen. 
If this is the case, then maybe it's time to go and get that library card and start reading. And if you're struggling for books to read, I've made a list of books that changed my life in the description. Also, listen to the Joe Rogan podcast if you're new to this thing. Um, It's a fantastic place to start. And that's it. That's my views on how to control your mind, I guess. Uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, and I promise I'll put another ecology podcast up soon. Thank you very much.